Uh, welcome to Taverns and Tavern Life in Early New England, presented by Tom Kelleher with Stores Library. My name is Patrick, and I will be facilitating this evening. Uh, this evening, Tom Kelleher will present on the role of taverns in early New England life. Taverns were, so, were as numerous as churches in early New England and played at least as large a role in public life of the community. Uh, from typical food and drink to the common topics discussed and, uh, and kinds of songs sung by the fireside, this talk will look at what it was like inside these public houses that dotted the highways and village centers of virtually uh, every town in New England. Uh, Tom Keller is, curr uh, is currently the historian curator of the mechanical arts at Old Sturbridge Village at, in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, where he where he has worn many hats, both literally and figuratively, over the last 35 years. A past uh, president of the International Association for Living History, Farm, and Agricultural Museums, he regularly teaches and demonstrates at museums and historical societies around the country. Tom holds a, a master's in history from the University of Connecticut and writes often for a variety of magazines and journals, including Early American Life. Uh, this program is co-hosted by Stores Library and the Longmeadow Historical Society. Uh, welcome, Tom, and thank you for joining us. Thank you all for having me, um, and uh, I hope that this is fun for everybody. Um, of course, I can only do an overview, but uh, we'll hope for the best, and here we go. So, so you don't have to look at me. We'll share a screen and start with the PowerPoint. Um, so, a taste of tavern life. Um, taverns were something that was at least one in every town. Uh, the selectmen here in New England usually would ask the county to allow licenses for them, realizing that it was much better to regulate um, public entertainment and the sale of liquors for public morality and other reasons um, than to just leave it up to chance. Uh, of course, there's a lot of fines for um, and penalties for not getting a license and doing it legally, just as there are today. Uh, taverns went by many names ordinaries, licensed houses, because of that idea of actual giving licensure, which also, you know, cut down on travelers just knocking on anybody's door at who knows what hour, um, trying to find food and drink. Um, inns, of course, that nice old English word, public houses from which we get the, the, the current and British use of pub from, if you weren't aware of that. And uh, by the early 19th century, they're increasingly called hotels. Um, the French word for house, to give them a lot more cachet. By the 1820s, 30s, 40s, you see a lot of these taverns adopting the name hotel to give them more um, panache, as it were. Anyway, so a lot of them were also stage taverns, um, which very often had porches on the front, the, the shelter, the, uh, the, the passengers getting on and off the stage coaches that were crisscrossing uh, the country, but especially New England. New England and New York, um, had the best roads in the country. When you walk around places like Old Sturbridge Village and see the dirt road, you think, oh, this is so crude compared to the mass bike. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, they're the best roads in the country because they are relatively flat, relatively smooth. They're crowned in the middle, so they do tend to drain and not become muddy quagmires. Yeah, you get puddles and mud, but the point is you can have animals pulling wagons with a considerable weight on the wagon or carriage um, and not completely uh, bounce the passengers and the cargo to atoms uh, doing it. So um, they're called stagecoaches, by the way, because they're, they stage fresh horses every eh, 15, 10, 15 miles along the route so they can make much better time. Um, you know, just like, just like uh, intergalactic space travel or even just suborbital space travel, we use uh, stages of rockets to get up there. They use stages of horses to get, um, to make better time. So after an hour or two, when your four horses were tired, they'd stop, swap out fresh ones. And while they're doing that, it allowed, um, it allowed uh, passengers to get um, off the stage, answer the call of nature, maybe get a bite to eat at the tavern, um, and then better to goodness get back on before the stage left without you. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, the, there's some pictures of the happy stagecoaches. As you can see, the horses aren't just strolling along. They're trying to make good time. And if you were the mail stage, um, in other words, if you were the stagecoach company that had the contract to carry the United States mail over that route, um, you had to operate under certain restrictions. You had to have a white male driver over 21. Uh, and you also had to deliver the mail seven days a week, um, which 
ticked off the uh, Sabbatarians and people enforcing New England blue laws, but we don't have to get into lots of details about that right now. That's a different lecture for another time. Here's a, a picture of a stagecoach sign in Barrie. We'll talk about stagecoach signs later, but here in uh, um, the sort of center of Massachusetts, North Center, Barrie, you can see how they very often, like today, made them high so you can see them from a great distance um, as travelers are coming into town um, to make it no no question of where the Holiday Inn, the Berry Tavern or whatever uh, establishment you're looking for happens to be. But the, the reality is the taverns um, by and large uh, were private homes that incorporated certain public spaces into them. But most taverns um, were basically a family's house, bigger than most, um, certainly with a license to, to entertain, oftentimes with a contract with a stagecoach lion to care for and stable horses. Um, and sometimes also they were the post office in the town. The government didn't build post offices as public buildings. They basically let the postmaster in each town appointed by, by the government um, uh, maintain the post office in his uh, private uh, property. So usually the postmasters were tavern keepers or storekeepers who had a public uh, role and a public business anyhow, um, and one that was at least available to receive the mail again seven days a week. But like I said, taverns are usually old houses. I have to thank the uh, the Longmeadow Historical Society. I usually, when I put these uh, lectures together, I usually throw in a couple images of whatever town um, is uh, sponsoring the talk so they don't feel left out. Um, but this one um, was was better than the image I had of the the white the old white tavern, which uh, had been an older house that um, carpenter David White bought and added a ballroom to and made it into a tavern in 1786, one of those public spaces. That's one hallmark of not every tavern, but a lot of them is that they have a place that they could rent out for public meetings, for public dances, for things like that, that most houses can't accommodate, but a public house could. Um, so again, thanks to, to Betty, don't let me butcher your name, or Becky, I should say, sorry, um, who, who uh, posted these things on the, uh, um, the, the website of the Historical Society and the Library. Um, another tavern in Longmeadow was originally the Thomas Bliss House, which uh, Nathaniel Eli bought um, in 1758, another old house, big house that uh, got a license and served on a busy road as, um, as a tavern. Um, and just some others we'll quickly flip through in, uh, in New England. Um, so you can see they're mostly big houses, the Swan Tavern in Leicester, um, and the Eagle Tavern in East Windsor, Connecticut. Here's a shot inside the Eagle Tavern in that, that uh, commodious ballroom. I think what the upstairs balcony is, is not so much for, um, you know, some dignitary to survey the dancing, but for the, uh, the band, the two or three musicians you'd hire for your dance to uh, provide music, since all music then had to be live, no DJs. Um, the old Orton Tavern in Woodbury, Connecticut, Again, you can see these things are usually um, have a lot in common, sometimes different roof styles. But again, like I said, a larger than average um, house, oftentimes with outdoor as well as indoor public accommodations. Um, and, and as New Englanders went west, their architecture and their traditions went with them. This is the Dunham Tavern in Cleveland, Ohio, on the uh, Cleveland, Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit stagecoach route. Again, stagecoaches being um, an important thing. It's kind of neat now because it was, it's, it's a very modern Cleveland, as you can see in these pictures, has built up around the Dunham Tavern, which still remains as a historical site out there. And of course, closer to home um, in Dudley, Massachusetts, the Black Tavern, um, and Shrewsbury and uh, Duxbury. Um, uh, forgive me, I'm not gonna waste time here to go through bad early poetry. Um, we'll get to bad early poetry some other time, uh, maybe later. The Williams Tavern, uh, arguably one of the oldest taverns in the country um, while it existed, it, it was destroyed in 1947, but uh, it's, it's one of the longest surviving because it was a 17th century tavern um, and Southbridge. One of the 
the hotels, because I mentioned hotel was the name that increasing was being used um, for these was the um, the Tremont House in, in Boston. And the Tremont House was in uh, 1830, it was built in 1829. And for many years, it had was the biggest and most luxurious tavern slash hotel in the United States. As you can see, it's um, purpose built for that, not just a large old house that somebody put a ballroom into um, and a bar room into, which we'll talk about later, but it was built in a large city, four stories high, faced with um, faced with uh, marble to be this, uh, granite, granite, I should say, it's faced with granite, um, and, you know, in a neoclassical style with that wonderful uh, Roman cupola on top. Um, <clears throat> at the corner of Tremont and ba Beacon Streets in Boston, with the main entrance being on Tremont, hence the name of the place. It had 170 rooms. Uh, they charged two dollars a night, which, when you consider that's like two days' pay, um, it probably goes for what a nice hotel in Boston goes for today in equivalent um, equivalent earning power. Um, but that two dollars then included four meals. Uh, it was designed in 1829 by Isaiah Rogers, and it had a number of famous guests in at time, including. Uh, Davy Crockett and Charles Dickens. Um, the Tremont House had a number of hotel firsts. It was the first American hotel with indoor plumbing and running water. Uh, there was actually a steam pump um, that uh, uh, pumped water up onto a tank hidden on the roof. Um, and then, of course, the water flowed by gravity um, to mostly the kitchen and the laundry. It's not like it's not like every room had running water, but every room did have a basin and ewer, um, plus a drinking water pitcher that was um, serviced at the guests' uh, whim by the uh, staff of the hotel. It had indoor toilets. Again, not for every room. There were actually six um, for 170 rooms. Um, there were, the toilets were all on the first floor, but it actually had flush toilets, which for 1829 was pretty advanced. It actually had baths. Again, not in every room, but in the basement, you had um, copper tubs with uh, cold running water that could be heated for a fee um, by, by coal gas. Um, so you could actually get a hot bath if you wanted to um, and not just wash up in your room with a basin and ewer, which country people weren't yet doing. This is a very, you know, um, effete aristocratic thing, the idea of personal bathing. Um, most people at the time washed what showed face and hands. But again, this isn't, isn't the lecture on personal hygiene of the 19th century, but we'll just touch on that. It had a reception area. It had locked guest rooms, which for $2 a night, I think is the least they could do. Um, the thing to remember is most taverns being, being um, just large private houses, you did not necessarily have the expectation that you would have a bed to yourself, much less a room to yourself. Very often, especially in Shire towns, county seats um, like Worcester, Springfield, Boston, et cetera, when the, um, the courts met uh, uh, several times a year, most of the lawyers in the county would descend upon the, that town and a lot of the clients and a lot of the people studying law, the law, the law, um, apprentices, if you were the young men reading law, um, as well as interested parties. And so hotel space was at a premium. So sharing beds um, was the norm, not just sharing rooms, but not at the Tremont house where you could, for that lofty sum of $2, get four meals a day, um, a pitcher of water whenever you wanted, warm water for washing when you wanted. And they even had free soap. That was another hotel first. I don't know if people actually stole the little soaps and took them home. I don't know. Um, but it was the first. It was also the first American hotel with bellboys um, in the egalitarian American Republic where people, you know, were um, looked down upon for using royal titles and expecting too much of their fellow citizens. Um, having a very subservient bellboy, especially here in the, the north, was considered a great uh, luxury and a hotel first. Anyway. Moving on from the Tremont House, we have the other end of the spectrum, the Frontier Tavern, and this one, the Arkansas Traveler. And you can see it's not nearly as luxurious as the granite-faced neoclassical Tremont House. Um, but being a tavern, they do advertise that they have drink, and there's the tavern keeper's um, lovely family ready to welcome the weary traveler from his rounds. Um, 
you did have a number of these what they called uh, inns or log cabin inns in in the frontier areas. Here's a little more dressed up one. A common uh, larger log cabin was two log cabins. They sometimes put clapboards on them later. And they'd often have two connected by a roof with an open breezeway porch between them. It was called a, a dog trot log cabin for obvious reasons. If we went back, we'd see the, um, the dog ready to trot if they had a second cabin, but they don't. Um, but anyhow, in 1825, um, Lyndon Freeman, the brother of Pliny Freeman, whose house and farm we've moved and recreated here at Old Sturbridge Village, for anybody who's been here, as I'm sure some of you have, um, Pliny Freeman's brother Lyndon and his family moved out to uh, Ohio in 1825, and, um, and the reminiscence was uh, as follows. I'll just read a few excerpts. After a toilsome journey of 25 days, um, by land, by canal, and by lake, we arrived at the city of Cleveland. They didn't stay at the Dunham Tavern. Um, sorry to disappoint you. It wasn't that nice for them. Um, sorry, I'll go back to the quote. From hence by ox team through mud and water to Greenbrier, um, soon to be Parma, Ohio, where we arrived late in the evening on Saturday night, much fatigued and dispirited. Our hostess, Mrs. B. Fay of the Log Inn, and Inn is in quotes, you can't see me doing air quotes because you're looking at the um, slide. But um, at the log in was quick to discern our need of cheering and with a laudable success set ourselves to relieve our tired and despondent minds. Um, he goes on to tell a story how one of the kids was missing and and they feared he was dead, but they found him under a big pile of blankets and other stuff in the in the ox cart they had and not, uh, you know, in a, drowned in a mud puddle on the side of the road. Anyway, he goes on to say, uh, we're all glad to accept the hospitality of, again, quotes, phase in a log hut of only two rooms and a loft where we boys and girls enjoyed that, quote, sweet, restoring, balmy sleep. So uh, it's kind of two ends of the lodging spectrum in early 19th century America. Um, I mentioned before that taverns often served as post offices um, with the tavern keeper being appointed. Uh, by the Postmaster General in Washington, if his politics uh, was was in keeping with the administration in power, or at least not too objectionable to it, to serve as the postmaster. And postmasters um, basically didn't deliver mail, you came to receive your mail. Again, why a public accommodation like a tavern or a store made sense. Um, but they also uh, sorted the mail when the stagecoach came, the stagecoach driver would throw down a box called the official portmanteau. The only person with a key was the postmaster, would unlock it, take out four bags, one labeled north, one south, one east, one west, um, and sort the mail going out into the appropriate bag, take the mail out of those bags that had come in, see if any were for his town, and send the rest on. Um, and as the mail got north, south, east, and west, they'd be sorted at certain other uh, larger post offices that got an extra couple cents per letter for this uh, extra work they would do. Um, anyhow, and then people would have to come and pick up their mail and usually pay for it. Most postage went postage due. Um, love letters usually were paid in advance. You could pay in advance, but most people, unless you're courting someone, uh, usually didn't um, let the person getting the letter worry about it. Anyhow, um, so, uh, Taverns often, these rail, these uh, stagecoaches often uh, connected uh, to um, with railroads and steamboats uh, and had fairly elaborate travel arrangements. Uh, so any trip usually involved a number of different uh, modes of transportation and a, a range of accommodations where one could find uh, rest and refreshment along the way. And where you found them was by looking at tavern signs. Um, this is, as you can see, one of the better ones, Jay Carter's Tavern, Jared Carter's Tavern in Killingsworth, Killingworth Connecticut, um, the Strangers Resort. And I don't know, I guess they're having such a good time, their hats are blowing off. I'm not sure what the image is, but, but you know, sometimes the uh, local artists would get quite creative in the image for the sign. But of course, the reason for a sign was to have something recognizable. Not everybody could remember the tavern keeper's name. Uh, to refer it if you're going through stay at the and so like today they tended to have oftentimes 
recognizable images, recognizable names by law, usually the tavern keeper's name had to be on there, usually the first initial, the last name, um, because they're the one holding the license. Um, that's usually part of the legal codes of most New England uh, states, but um, having a recognizable sign. I mean, you just see the big blue, uh, blue and red six glowing in the distance. You know it's a hotel. You see the golden arches. You know you can get hamburgers. You see the smiling colonel here. You know that uh, there's there's chicken chicken awaiting, or the big um, uh, H or the bell. Um, anyhow, um, so the tavern signs are usually put up high, as I mentioned before, so people could see them. Sometimes on the building itself, but oftentimes, like today, um, up up elevated so that they're more visible and uh, that travelers can see them coming in at a distance and know what they're getting into. The um, old Sturbridge Village has a fairly reputable collection of tavern signs which are displayed in our um, Stephen Brewer Theater. Uh, the best collection of New England tavern signs is though at the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, and th this is a personal digression, I hope you'll forgive me. The one on the left, um, it, which is in the Connecticut Historical Society. I, I, I'd like to think of it as the sign of the stunned ox. I love the look of surprise on the poor bovine's face. This actually has gotten reproduced uh, as the tavern of the Noon Inn at um, Old Bethpage Village on Long Island, where I used to be their occasional cooper for like 25 years. Um, and so this sign has always had great familiarity and appeal to me, but the look of surprise on the poor, <laughs> the poor bovine's face always amuses me. Anyhow, Mr. Loomis's sign, which is in the center of this next slide, you know, is much more direct about what you'll find at D. Loomis's Inn, um, namely uh, alcoholic refreshment. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, you have to have usually by law, the, uh, the inholder's name on it, but having a recognizable image so that people can remember it, uh, recognize it as they're coming into town um, is oftentimes uh, helpful, especially if the image can sort of uh, reflect the name of the tavern keeper um, or, 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 or appeal to his, um, his uh, Masonic brothers like uh, Mr. Holcomb's tavern here on the right, where we've got all sorts of symbols of the uh, loyal order of Masons um, to tell them, so, okay, stay with me, I'm a Mason. We've got the all seeing eye of God. We've got the pillars, we've got the checker, but we've got the, the compass and square. Stay with me, we're brothers. We took an oath, it's a secret society. We'll have a good time. Um, of course, patriotism, you see more than other, other places, the, the American Eagle with the olive branch and the arrows of war um, clutched. Um, in its talons. Um, but again, the I'm the person holding the license and I'm fulfilling the law by putting my name up there. Um, um, some better than others. This GW Maori is the one we've adapted here at Old Sturbridge Village for one of our taverns, the Bullard Tavern um, with the, the rising sun um, and the busy bee, the beehive. And of course, eagles are good things. And I'll mention a little later, you also have the idea of temperance taverns, um, alcohol being a problem in early America. Um, you did have some people trying to have ones that were dry, not usually very economically successful, but be that as it may. Let's talk for a little bit about tavern food rather than tavern drink, um, which we'll get to. We have plenty of time for that. Um, the thing to remember about these taverns is that they're not restaurants. Um, there's no menus. Um, you eat at regular meal times and you eat family style. Excuse me. Um, and so basically it's family dinner, but for a fee. You're joining the family, whatever the lady of the house is making and serving, um, you, if you pay your 15 cents, 25 cents, whatever it is, unless it's like the Tremont house where it's included, um, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to sit at the, at the table with other lodgers and the family. The first restaurant actually was in America, was um, in New York City, it was Delmonico's, which many of you have heard of, when in 1830, uh, uh, Italian-speaking Swiss brothers Giovanni and Pietro Delmonico hired French cooks and brought over their nephew Lorenzo, 
um, to manage the place and turned what had been a confectionery, a candy shop, into a, um, a, a restaurant, a place where you ate not just to sustain yourself, but as entertainment, as a dining adventure, as before the pandemic, so many of us used to do. Um, you know, it's an adventure. Do you want to go out for Greek, Italian, Chinese? Oh, it'll be fun. You know, it's, it's not just, uh, I have to eat or I'll starve to death. Not me, but, <laughs> but uh, many of us, um, you know, we eat for pleasure. And, um, and uh, you, you learn a lot about the, uh, the, the food and the people from pe one of the best places to learn about it is actually Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne in the 1830s doing research for his novels uh, traveled through New England and kept extensive notebooks for himself, did character descriptions, described the places so that he could use these things later in his um, fictional writing. Um, and but these notebooks have been preserved, they've been transcribed and published, and they're widely available uh, online as well as um, in hard copies in research libraries like the one here at Old Stubbridge Village. Um, and so we they're, they're both good and bad descriptions of people, but uh, he describes the dining room. The dining rooms are usually long tables, sometimes a few small tables, it varies. Usually the dining room has the best chairs in the, um, in the tavern. Um, and there's various and sundry foods. One thing is milk and bread. Now we might think mil milk and bread or bread and milk is, is kind of a weird thing to eat. But when you think about it, a lot of Americans eat this for breakfast most days, except we pay a lot more for it because the bread is in little chunks with sometimes weird colored marshmallows in a box that costs four or $5 instead of just little bits of stale bread. Um, we pour milk on it. Um, so it was a real staple uh, for breakfast or supper. Um, this we have at Ulsterbridge Village, the Salem townhouse, and one letter home to his wife, Sally, he, he wrote home how he you know, had, a, had a, a bowl of bread and milk, which will sustain me for the night for supper. Um, the main meal, though, uh, was dinner, which was always a large meal. The second largest meal was, um, and dinner was usually in the uh, mid to early afternoon. Um, breakfast was the second biggest meal, which was usually fried leftovers, fried mush, ham, beef, pork, sausage, hash, potatoes, bread, always bread, butter, honey, preserves, pies, pickles, relishes, fish, chicken. Um, some taverns really special, like the Birdsley Inn, I showed you the sign from before, really specialized in occasionally having bird suppers when they, um, the tavern keeper and his friends would go out and kill pigeons and other game birds and cook them up in pies um, and other concoctions. But some would have steaks, chops, but usually you're having stews and boiled dinners um, accompanied by vegetables in season. You didn't have the luxury of, the, of whatever vegetable you want all year round. And usually for beverages, tea, coffee, hard cider was really common on the table. Uh, and a lot of people would order for an extra fee, wine or, um, or liquor and have that with their meals. Um, and tavern keepers usually oftentimes were farmers or had a farm and partially supplied their own tables. They also bought um, in the real town of Sturbridge, Massachusetts. The primary tavern keeper in the 1830s was a man named Cromwell Bullard. And his father-in-law was one of the wealthy farmers in town, a guy named Perez Walker. And even though Perez Walker was an ardent uh, temperance advocate, was against hard drink, one of his best customers was his son-in-law, the tavern keeper, Cromwell Bullard, who he was selling all kinds of food and produce to, um, to, to feed the guests at, uh, at Bullard's Hotel, as they were calling it. Anyhow, that gets into drink, um, which, of course, is one of the more fascinating aspects and the real lucrative part of keeping a tavern, at least most taverns. Um, Today, a restaurant will usually try to get a liquor license because it's much more profitable. You get a higher markup on liquor than, than I, you do on food. Um, and so the focus of that was called the bar room because they kept the liquor behind bars so that the guests couldn't help themselves. Um, you often see these uh, barred off little areas, uh, which would usually have a, 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 a door, a bar door that could lower or swing shut. So when the proprietor could not be there, people couldn't help themselves to the, to the liquor. They're also called, sometimes called tap rooms because that's where you tap the kegs, tap the barrels of, of, the, of the potent potables that the guests are consuming. So sometimes they're called both. Um, but anyway, what people usually came to drink 
was um, Americans came were drink, were hard drinkers. Uh, the historian W. J. Rohrbard described Americans in the late 18th, early 19th century as an alcoholic republic. Um, liquor consumption was three to five gallons of raw alcohol per year. That's like three times what I think it is per capita today in the early 21st century. And I don't think many people would deny that on average, Americans drink a fair bit, um, especially uh, after the pandemic. But anyhow, um, so it was both social customs and drinking drams. Um, you know, one British observer basically observed that Americans, you know, when they get up, they drink. When they go to bed, they drink. When they meet, they drink. When they part, they drink. When they agree on something, they drink. When they die, they drink at the funeral. When they have an election, they drink and complain if they lost and celebrate if they won. It's basically Americans just take any occasion they can to drink. Anyhow, um, uh, so you have this, 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 this culture of drinking. And usually if you go to a tavern, you're not there to have fermented beverages, beer, cider, things that are naturally fermented. That's what you drink with meals. That's what you drink at home. Yes, you can get them at a tavern. But if you're going to a tavern to drink and not just to have it with your dinner, you usually order hard liquor. Um, and usually the liquor you ordered uh, in was was rum. Rum is far and away the most popular drink in New England. Um, second to that is gin, which is neutral grain spirits uh, flavored, usually with juniper berries or anything that gives it a kind of a, a piney flavor um, or brandy. And when they say brandy in New England, they don't usually mean fine French cognac. What they mean is apple cider that's, that's um, been hard cider uh, that's been distilled so that it's higher in alcohol. So it's cider brandy, but they don't usually bother with the adjective cider because everybody knew that most of the time they're drinking cider brandy. You could buy if you had money and wanted it, um, you know, French or imported brandies. But usually when people were drinking for the, um, the, the uh, inebriating qualities of alcohol, they were drinking local or regionally made cider brandy. Um, but rum was their drink of choice. And there's basically two kinds of rum, by the way. Um, let me go back. Um, you could have New England rum, which was fairly high in alcohol content. It was fairly harshly flavored. It usually was pretty clear, did not have a lot of um, uh, flavor to it. it. Not a pleasant flavor. Um, your, your better rum, which cost about twice as much, was called uh, West Indies rum. Um, from the Caribbean, uh, made in the Caribbean. New England rum was made from molasses, but it was Caribbean molasses, but distilled, uh, fermented and distilled in usually greater Boston. Um, there were over 100 uh, rum distilleries in, in, in eastern Massachusetts. Um, and, and, and so that was your cheap liquor. Your better rum was from the West Indies. Um, so you look at early records, they have any New England rum and WI, West Indies rum. The West Indies rum made in the Caribbean tended to have a lot more flavor and color to it. So it was a darker rum, um, like a very high alcohol uh, content Myers or Gosling Black Seal or Myers Planters Punch kind of rum. Um, had a lot more flavor because distilled in the Caribbean, they left in what they called the scummins, the leftovers from the pressing and the sugar cane and the fermentation process. They also put it to a higher alcohol content. So they're shipping more rum and less water um, uh, from the Caribbean. And because it's traveling in oak barrels between the scummins and the oak, it picks up color and flavor. So anyway, the better rum was the West Indies rum. I could go on all night about rum, but I'm getting thirsty, so I'm going to go on. The myth of beer and ale. I don't know how many times I've had to deal with marketing people and other folks um, trying to go on or people just writing for general history and they go, oh, and the colonials are wafting their, their steins of beer. And it's, well, not around here, they're not. I mean, beer is not a big, um, a, a big beverage in rural New England. Cowswives make it when they run out of hard cider. Um, that's what beer is for. Um, 
beer is sometimes something that ship's captains will will buy because the sailors want to drink because it'll taste better and keep better than water on a ship. But beer, you got to drink a lot of it to really get drunk. And captains knew that. Um, so it's better to have that on board than hard liquor, um, especially on the coastal ships. So anyway, there were there was I mentioned there were there were hundreds of, of rum distilleries. There was one beer company employed eight people in Boston, in, in Massachusetts in 1830. One, New England Beer Company. It's not the same one that makes Sam Adams now. That was, you know, invented in the late 20th century. But, you know, they use the same name. Um, but eight people it employed. And it mostly sold to a few local taverns and, and ship's captains. Um, New England, excuse me, English beer um, is a top fermenting beer. So the yeast is exposed on top. What works in England doesn't work well in the climate of America. There's other bacteria. There's other yeasts that give it a bad flavor, that make it go, yeah, taste bad. Um, and, and so New Englanders had substituted rum for beer uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. So while they're drinking some beer, they're not drinking a lot of it. It's not until the mid to late 19th century when you have bottom fermented German and Central European pilsners and lagers coming in when you have refrigeration, both with cut ice and then mechanical refrigeration, making the lighter bottom fermented German beers that keep better. You have pasteurization coming along and you've just plain had the influence of German immigrant culture, making beer a popular drink in American taverns. But in the early 1800s, the 1700s, not so much, maybe with dinner if the wife ran out of hard cider, but sometimes some people like to order porter, a higher alcohol imported English ale. But um, anyhow, but it's the triangle trade that makes rum you know, so popular. Um, this trade that New England has with Africa and the Caribbean that includes people, not just molasses and liquor, but uh, that's another topic. Um, like I said, the big, everyday beverage that people drank was hard cider um, and they distilled it into cider brandy. So most apples in New England were not eaten. They were, they were drunk um, there because that's the easiest way to uh, preserve apples and to use them was to ferment them. You go to Central Europe today, the big crop is plums and they're not eating a lot of plums. They're, they're turning into plum brandy, which, you know, in Poland is Schlibowitz, which in Romania is Zoika. It's, it's the best way they can do it. Anyway, whiskey. Um, the, the whiskey culture of making whiskey, distilling grains into a hard liquor that has some color and flavor to it with time, is, is part of the people that come to England from Northern England that settle the West and the South. Um, it's not in the tradition of the Southern English that settle New England. There's not a lot of intentional whiskey drinking in the Northeast until later in the 19th century. I say intentional because, and that's what it says, cheap disguised drink of the Northeast. By the um, late 17, early 1800s, you had new lands opened up in the, um, uh, the frontier uh, that were basically having trouble taking all the grain they could get corn and other grains they could grow and getting them east. They would distill them into whiskey, a much more concentrated and valuable product than corn and sell that. Um, it became very widely consumed on the frontier and shipped east. In the east, a lot of rum distillers were buying Western whiskeys, putting it in the vat because they could buy Western whiskey cheaper they can make rum. And so they dilute their rum with Western whiskey and sell it as rum. You look at industrial surveys, they talk about how many, you know, um, thousands of gallons of, of whiskey there, these rum distillers are buying to, um, to sell as rum. It's just a, just a, a cheap way of getting alcohol. Um, and if that's what you're up for, of course, the Whiskey Rebellion was the first great test of the new constitution, America's Union, when some uh, people on the Pennsylvania frontier thought, why should we pay taxes to uh, this new government? Wasn't the revolution that we just fought about not wanting to pay taxes? They didn't, didn't quite get the whole intent of it. So George Washington, Alexander Hamilton here rode out and, and uh, brought some soldiers and told them, look, this is a new government. We mean business. And they backed down. And uh, anyway, so mixed drinks 101. 
because I look at the clock and I've been rambling. I apologize. Um, don't worry, Pat. I'll, I'll get back on, on track. So mixed drinks, because um, most people like to drink liquor. Um, you could have straight liquor. People drank straight liquor. You look at tavern accounts, they're doing that a lot. They're also drinking grog. Grog's not just for pirates. Grog is watered down liquor, usually rum. So rum and water, it's called grog. Um, sea captains on oceanic voyages would oftentimes have rum on board and then water it down so that the, sol the sailors wouldn't get too drunk, but also they would have a little incentive and would have the nasty tasting water not be so objectionable. So, but, but it's not just for sailors. People in taverns are drinking grog all the time. If you add a little sugar to your grog to make it even more appealing, then you have mim or mimbo. Um, or sometimes they'll just sweeten up the grog. You heat that up with a loggerhead, a iron bar that's often round, a bigger at one end. You keep that in your fireplace till it's glowing red and you plunge that into a glass of, of rum and, um, and water and little sugar and it foams up and gets really hot in a couple of seconds and you have a hot toddy. Um, and that's what the loggerhead or the mulling iron is for. And if people come to loggerheads, it's because they're drunk. They pick up these hot iron bars and say, hey, and start fighting, you know, because it's, you know, like, like in the 1950s bar movies, they break the bottle and go after each other. So anyway, so in the hierarchy of mixed drinks rolling along, you take your, um, your mim, your spirits, your water, your sugar, and you add some lemon juice to it. Uh, citrus was very popular in colonial and early modern America, mostly imported from at first Spain and Portugal and then Spain and Sicily and other places in the Mediterranean and eventually from uh, northern Florida um, and uh, in, in the 19th century went along um, <clears throat> and you have a sling um, today, you know, probably the, the best sling we know is the Singapore sling from Raffles Long Bar in Singapore which is a wonderful place. If you're in Singapore, go have a Singapore sling in Raffles Long Bar. I have, it's worth it. It's really cool. Anyway, um, if you mix your sling in a bowl, make a lot of it, add a little spice, some nutmeg or some mace or, or some other spice um, and invite friends along, then you have punch. When I gave this lecture in Ohio once at a tavern out there, I talked about, I, I was saying, well, they'd pass this bowl around and people would, you know, kind of like, forgive me, but, you know, people will sometimes pass a marijuana cigarette around and everybody will imbibe. And people looked at me like I had two heads. So I said, well, you know, it's like a, uh, like an Asian restaurant where you get the scorpion bowl and it comes to the table and everybody gets a straw. And they looked at me like I had three heads. So I guess scorpion bowls and, and, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and cannabis are not so well viewed in the Midwest. But anyway, hopefully you might understand the scorpion bowl. But so passing around the communal uh, bowl of, of punch was a very common way for early tavern uh, goers to enjoy a mixed drink, not individually. So punch was very popular. Here's a cartoon from the late 1700s of three imbibers of punch. Um, here they're a little more upper class, so they have their own glasses. Which, which went on as well, but people would often pass the bowl around. And so, but this is written right to left. Punch cures the gout, as the guy who, of course, gout is often caused by too much drinking, but you drink more because your feet hurt. And then, of course, it cures, cures the colic, the indigestion, which, of course, alcohol will give you heartburn and other stuff. And this guy here who's drunk and can't pronounce is saying the physic, you know, he's got um, other digestive and, and physical maladies that he thinks the liquor is going to cure. Anyway, there's some fellows passing the bowl around and taking a good hit of the, of the rum punch um, and some other fellows enjoying themselves with their wigs falling off. If you had the big wig, usually you shaved your head so that uh, it, it fit better, but we're not going to go into wigs. If you went on to this hierarchy of liquor and you added bitters to your concoction, and put it in individual glasses. Then you had a cocktail. Uh, I'll read you. I, I know it's bad form to read from slides, but um, I will. I will um, read you the uh, the definition from 1806 of what a cocktail was. Cocktails, a stimulating liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters, is vulgarly called bittered sling, as it is supposed to be an excellent electioneering potion, as it 
renders the heart stout and bold at the same time it, bef it fuddles the head. It is said also to be of great use to a democratic candidate because a person having swallowed a glass of it is ready to swallow anything else. So there we go. Um, that's the bitters that make up the cocktail. Um, the whole idea, oh, I'm going backwards, not forwards, sorry. The whole idea of the cocktail is probably an American mispronunciation of the French word um, uh, that New Orleans inventor of Pachad bitters, which are still the preferred bitters to make um, drinks like old fashions with. In the late 1700s, he served brandy mixed with bitters and egg cups is the French word for egg cup. There's a whole source of imagined nonsense definitions you'll read online about where the word cocktail comes from, about horses with, with shortened tails and chicken feathers and drinks for decoration and, and gingers and equine suppository. And, and you're, you're drinking the cocktailings, the dregs of the barrel. And it's, you know, it's, it's cocked ale, you know, beer with alcohol added to it, like a boiler maker nonsense. Um, but, but it's bitters that make a cocktail. The first bartender's guide, 1862 by Jerry Thomas, how to mix drinks, the Bon Vivant's companion lists 10 cocktail recipes, individual drinks, not punches, all with bitters. And then you've got the fancy fussy drinks. Um, you know, these alcoholic beverages that have whipped eggs and cream and fruit and spices and sugar. Are these drinks or desserts? A lot of them now are meant as desserts with little alcohol in them. The one that sometimes men would actually order at bars at the, with their friends was called Flip. Um, originally, it's a mixture of beer and rum and sugar and heated with that red hot iron to make it flippy or frothy, um, where it gets its name. By the 1800s, sometimes they're beating in eggs and nutmeg added, and they're leaving out beer because they don't have beer. Um, and, uh, and then they pour it back and forth from glass to glass to get that foam that they liked because they don't want to heat it up anymore because Americans are getting away from heat, heated drinks, except in winter. Um, and, but you know, you start, now you get online recipes. They had cream added, and which sure sounds like you know, the eggnog that some of us were drinking last, uh, last month. Um, but anyhow, um, so then you got these fussy things that possets and syllabubs that have cream and wine and sugar and lemon juice and lemon peels and orange peels and, and curdled cream. Um, you can go online, and get a lot of recipes for it, including old ones like these, but I'd call these more, you know, um, fussy drinks than things that people are really ordering in taverns very often, except for, uh, um, fancy occasions. But I mentioned the alcoholic problem that America had that led to a big okay, reform movement. That led to a big reform movement, the, um, the, the temperance movement in the, um, the late, excuse me, the early 1700s, the late, eight, late 17, early 1800s. Um, this is the drunkard's progress, how he first has a, a glass with a friend and a glass to keep out the cold. And then it gets worse and worse and worse until he finally kills himself because his life is so miserable after this degradation. Um, of course, this cuts into drinking and cuts into um, taverns um, and their profits. But on to, on to lodgers who stayed at taverns as um, people like um, Hawthorne described, uh, traveling people, peddlers. There were a lot of traveling salesmen um, on the road uh, many staying in taverns, some staying with people they were trying to sell to, but also a lot of itinerants making their living on the road. Portrait painters, house painters, um, dentists usually traveled around, um, as well as, uh, as authors like Cawthorn and uh, ministers and clergy and a lot of other folks just traveling on business. And of course, taverns are also entertaining local patrons. It's a place for the guys to hang out. Um, it's a place for that, that inn uh, to have a ballroom where people can dance um, and uh, either impromptu or more formalized ballrooms. I love this picture. This is by John Lewis Krimmel, a, a German who uh, moved to Pennsylvania in the early 1800s. This, this, painter, uh, this painting, I think, it, it speaks a thousand words. The fellow in the center is a shoemaker who uh, is not wearing socks. He's not wearing half his clothes. He's not doing work, although he has his apron on. He's just hanging out in the tavern with the boys. And here's his poor wife and his poor barefoot, you'll notice, child 
please, honey, come back to work. Give up the glass. Oh, I'm having a good time. I'm like, please, daddy, come home. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm going to keep an eye on this. This is going to be good. Uh, <laughs> this guy looking up from his paper is, oh, come on in, have a drink. Nope, not me. I'm getting out of here. This is getting to be nonsense. Oh, yeah, I'm going to mix another drink here, the happy bartender says. And here's a peddler arriving, the boy at the stove keeping warm looks up from his paper to see this domestic bliss going on. And here's the stagecoach arriving, a happy traveler coming in and saying, give me a drink. I've been on the road. It's dusty. So anyway, like I said, a hall for rent for dances and balls and meetings. Um, and, uh, and it was illegal to play at games and gamble at taverns, but it went on all the time. Um, and songs, uh, people, all music was live and very often, uh, when people have had a few drinks, they sing songs. And since usually the bar room is the domain of men, except for the members of the tavern keeper's family who might be serving drinks, they're oftentimes bawdy songs. This is George Washington's favorite on the right. Um, here's to the maiden. Here's to the maiden of bashful 15, now to the widow of 50. Here's to the flaunting extravagant queen. And here's to the housewife that's thrifty. Let the, let the toast pass. Drink to the last. A warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Let's let the toast pass, drink to the last. A warrant shall prove an excuse, excuse for the glass. Here's to the charmer whose dimples we prize. Now to the maid who has none, sir. Here's to the girl with a pair of blue eyes. And here's to the nymph with but one, sir. On and on and on. Um, and some of them are quite bawdy. The lusty young smith. Um, I, I won't get into here, but you can imagine what happens when the lusty young smith and the... Uh, the buxom young damsel comes to smiling and asks if to her forge he would go. The original words were not a jingle bang jingle. It was something much more graphic. This is a 20th century boulderized version that I dare share with the public. Um, but anyhow, uh, I should wrap it up. I know I've been rambling for a good 50 minutes now, so I'll, um, I'll let it go. And if anybody has any queries, Pat, you could you... Um, let me know and uh, I'll try Absolutely. to answer them. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please indicate in the chat. Uh, and then I'll, or if you can type out your question, I'll be able to read it. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, stay anonymous, didn't want to um, uh, be recorded. Um, but if you do, please let me know and I'll have, uh, I'll have you uh, unmuted. That way you can ask your question. Okay. Where was the sign uh, E Eli or E Elay? Oh, golly. Okay. I don't remember. I think that's the Connecticut Historical Society. Okay. Um, uh, Mel Melissa has a question. Let me find her. Uh, on Buter, so that way she can she can share. Uh, hi, okay. I, hi, I can hi, hi. <laughs> hi, Tom. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Oh, thanks. I have several questions, but I don't want to hog. Um, I'll start with with um, so I know here in Longmeadow we had at least two taverns, and I guess my question is: Would a house set out to be a tavern, or would it become a tavern based on the owner or the resident's choice? And what would make a good tavern keeper? Ah, that's why a great. Someone, question. why would someone want that? That's that. Those those are great questions. Um, so usually, at least you know, in the in the in the eighteen hundreds, eighteenth century, seventeen hundreds, and eight early eighteen hundreds, taverns tend to be just a larger house that um, eventually become a tavern. They're not usually built as a hotel like the Tremont house in Boston was built in 1829 as a hotel um, so usually they're just a larger house that there's an opportunity there to get a license and have a public house and they grow up like that um, you know sometimes you do have people intentionally building a house larger than average hoping they'll get a license and become a, um, a hotel or a tavern but uh, usually they they're a more evolutionary thing and they come and go um as far and like anything else in real estate it's location 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 you want to have some either central or on a major highway have a connection like the stagecoach route like the um 
uh, or a stagecoach stop, um, be a post office, all these things enhance the value of being a tavern. Um, so that's important. Um, it's up to the selectmen to advise the county commissioners if they need another tavern. You've got backlash not to license more as the temperance movement comes along in the early 1800s. What makes a good tavern keeper or why would someone want to do it? Um, well, it's, it's, it's another opportunity other than farming, um, which is what most people are doing or working a trade. In that sense, it's not as reliant upon your physical health and stamina, um, which fades with time um, as some of us know, and some of us will find out. Um, <laughs> anyway, and so, and so, uh, and so that's an appeal of it. It was something that would involve more of the family. Um, the tavern keeper in the 1830s in the real town of Sturbridge, Cromwell Bullard, he had his wife and his widowed mother working for him as employees because keeping house, a lot of that is women's work. And so it put your female household members to more productive, uh, profitable use um, from that cynical, uh, misogynistic viewpoint, but still practical. Um, and and uh, so, you know, I think to be a good tavern keeper, you need to have uh, a genial nature. Um, you know, if somebody is always mean and grumpy, you're not going to attract people, um, especially the locals who are your bread and butter or travelers. Um, so you have to have a certain geniality. Uh, the ability, like a good tavern keeper today, to know when to keep selling the drinks and know when to cut somebody off. And also that sort of business sense. You could not, most business in the late 17, in the 17 and 1800s was done on credit. Um, and a lot of tavern business was done on credit, people running tabs. The difference is, is that the laws did not allow you to recover debt for drink. So while people ran tabs at taverns, Everybody knew the tavern keeper, unlike anybody else, could not bring you to court to demand that payment. If I'm selling you cheese, butter, land, I'm having my son mow hay for you, you don't pay me, I can bring you to court and sue you, and they'll seize your property and sell it at auction, and, or I can put you in jail to force you to pay, all these other things, but not for drink. So if a tavern keeper extended credit, which most of them did to regulars, it was this sort of gentleman's agreement that, okay, you know, I'm going to need payment. And you sometimes see that sometimes these people are doing work for the tavern keeper, which pays them back. Um, not that everybody's working for the tavern keeper for their, for their bar tab. But so anyway, I think that that savvy nature um, is uh, also the hallmark of a successful tavern keeper. Um, and have and and looking for opportunities um, to rent out the ballroom um, for slaying parties and and other and dances and things like that to be able to um, encourage that kind of thing to accommodate to be able to be somebody who could rent out your flatware and your glassware for like a public celebration and picnic on you know on um, on a lawn outside maybe outside your tavern. Um, you know, on the 4th of July or something like that, because you see that going on. So it's that business savvy in so many ways, I think is the hallmark of a good tavern keeper. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions from, from the chat or from, from any of the uh, other participants? I can ask a second <laughs> and then I'll be done. <laughs> so Tom, there's so much talk about um, what everyone's drinking in the taverns and um, what, uh, so taverns are, I guess, the domain of traveling men. Would women and children come through and then what are they drinking and are they as much partaking in, in the- That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, taverns are the domain of a lot of local men um they're the local place where the guys hang out when they don't want to go home um or 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 they're working on the side of town where the tavern is not near their house and so it's cheaper them for them to get meals and sometimes sleep at the tavern while they're you know if they're a carpenter you know building a house nearby rather than walking eight miles or five miles home every night um 
so it's not just travelers it's a lot of locals that aren't staying there but are drinking there which i dare say is a big and sometimes taking meals there especially single men um uh working trades and such um so there's that part of it but um as far as women and children i mean you don't have as much family travel and vacation travel as you do today or we did until recently i should probably say um but uh but you do have certainly women and sometimes families traveling um a lot of times in these country taverns what would happen is the lady of the house would have women and the less often children come into her parlor um some larger taverns and urban taverns would have a separate room for the ladies called the ladies parlor um where you know you're not going to have the rough bar room carousing conversation smoking um drinking um off-color jokes off-color songs but a more genteel atmosphere you know in a smaller country tavern it's going to be actually the family parlor that your the ladies are invited into so again it's it's a it's a house but it's a public house but the bigger ones would have separate ladies parlors for um for for the women that might be traveling um, we have an, another question here. Uh, we have heard a story that the White Tavern had a moving floor for dancing. Uh, what could that mean, possibly? Um, I I don't know. I'm not that familiar with the White Tavern. I think what it might mean is it's got a what's called a sprung floor. Um, it's it's uh, it's more lively. In other words, it's it's uh, built to be supported, but it has a little bit of give to it. Um, rather than a lot of stiffness to it um, so that it's it's part of the uh, the the supports for it which of course you want to have fewer posts and a more open floor plan so that people aren't you know doing dancing and bumping into the posts all the time um, that's another hallmark of these these ballrooms is they're they're engineered to be more open um, and so you have to uh, it's part of the 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 house right who puts it together his his skill so i think that might be what it means to have a moving floor um is that it's sometimes called the sprung floor where it's got a little more give to it which you know makes it nicer for dancing so it's kind of like you know dancing on a, on a ballroom rather than on a concrete slab you know it's uh okay we have another question um uh another uh viewer is asking, I wonder if there is a comprehensive list of colonial taverns and their owners? I don't know of one. Um, what I do when I wanna find out taverns, there were um, what are called uh, state registers published annually in, in the New England states where they do uh, usually list um, tavern keepers, postmasters, sometimes storekeepers um, in each town and other officials. So I don't know of you know a, a comprehensive um, list of all colonial taverns. Um, there might have been some compiled for certain towns or certain regions, but I don't know of a reliable, there might be out there, but I don't know of it. I would, I would look at state registers for that kind of information um, as a place to start, but there there are both good and bad books out there um about taverns and a lot of them are bad um there's a lot of there's a lot of what i call speculative history you know people that take every myth and do might could have could have might have might have could have sometimes everybody nobody ever yeah mm. those those are those are clues that uh don't believe a word you're reading um uh, we have another question. Uh, how might a traveler be assured of finding a bed for the night? Uh, what options might there be? Uh, would there be that were like normal, like every day? Well, I mean, you know, like like today, there are no guarantees. You, un, unlike to, you can't you can't you can't call ahead. Um, you might write ahead. Um, you might have an, a, a letter of introduction, um, depending who you are and why you're traveling. Uh, you know, if you're a minister, you you probably are going to um, uh, write ahead or have a mutual acquaintance write ahead to the local minister and stay at his house rather than, um, you know, stay at a more uh, questionable place like a like a public tavern. Um, a lot of people did rely on these personal connections um, and wrote ahead 
um, or carried a letter of introduction uh, with them and uh, did not stay at taverns. But if you stay at a tavern, you know, there are no guarantees. Um, money helps, you know, the more the more uh, silver you can cross the tavern keeper's palm with, the better you're going to be treated. Um, you know, if we had hours, I could tell you all sorts of uh, period, period uh, jokes about taverns and tavern keepers and how people put one over on the tavern keeper and, and sometimes how the tavern keeper puts one over on his guests. Um, so, but I don't think we have time for that. So anyhow, another time. Uh, I don't see another question, but I have a question. Uh, I wanted to know if there were any kind of um, cultural kind of things from England that were brought over by the various colonists who came over, um, or and if there were any like unique New England kind of additions to taverns. Well, I I would I would I would say kind of you've got kind of the um, the fact that this increasingly is an English society. It's it's the the co colonial the colonists you know really tried to supplant native culture. So it's not like um, you have them moving into a, an established indigenous culture and then putting an English gloss on it. Uh, it's, it's a much less pretty version than that. Of course, it's, 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 it's a supplanting um, and a, I won't go so far as saying genocide, but it's, it's a, a suppression and then some of uh, indigenous cultures. Um, so it's it's basically translating English culture to the new world and then putting a more American gloss on it. One thing that English travelers who are usually not the lower class, but uh, tend to be upper and upper middle class travelers are taken aback by is the more egalitarian nature of American uh, taverns. The fact that it is a private home and people aren't completely subservient to the, to the guest. You know, English travelers expect to come in and saying, get me my dinner and I want this and I want that and I want it now, as opposed to dinner is going to be probably around one o'clock. And I don't know what the wife is making today, but I'm sure it'll be good as opposed to I want veal chops and I want them now. And, you know, it's three in the afternoon and I'm hungry and I want to have this and I want to have that. Uh, the tavern keeper would probably, you know, mix you a drink when you want it, but um, and sell you a cigar or some pipe tobacco. But as far as this much more uh, uh, class society of Great Britain, um, and uh, the, the guest being of an upper class that could demand that kind of subservience, um, that didn't fly, especially after the revolution. Um, that just did not fly. And English travelers were routinely taken aback by that. All right, we have like two more questions that we'll, um, we'll go through and then, um, cause we've gone over a little bit, but I, I, I really like the, the, the conversation. So was there a standard published rate for a night at a no at a nope it's what the market will bear it's what the market will bear um you know and it, that that's that's not just true of taverns taverns is true of stores you don't have stated prices it's it's you know so so the the proprietor could adjust depending on the demand depending on the customer i mean truthfully hotel rates are kind of like that now you know they float you know if you're in a city they're, the rooms are cheaper on the weekends. And if you're at a resort, if you're in a touristy place, the rooms are cheaper during the week. Um, you know, if you're on the beach, they're cheaper in the winter. They're more expensive in the summer. You know, the, uh, hotel rates vary now. They varied then. Um, they're, you know, it's, it's not as, as computerized, organized. And you don't have chains of, uh, of lodging as you do now. But um, no, it's, it's what the, what the what the proprietor thinks he can get away with um all right uh thank you uh, for, for our last question are you familiar with the flagon and trencher society a, a lineage society for i am not descendants of Sorry. colonial patterns nope all right well um thank you so much tom uh, uh this this has been great everyone I, I well, thanks for having comments. me yeah yeah <laughs> It's it's been it's been really great. Everyone's been been uh, been very uh, very pleased posting all their their comments. Uh, oh, good. 
um, you know, thanking you. Uh, you know, this has been awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Tom and Stores Library. We're, we're um, that uh, I think everyone everyone has really enjoyed uh, uh, today and tonight for uh, for your program. Well, good. Thank you for for spending an hour or so with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. All right. Go, so go make a rum punch, everybody. Have a good yeah. night. <laughs> All right, take care all. And then here we...